Good morning again, everybody. <laughs> oh, thank you. you. Good, Elijah? Thanks, man. Awesome. All right. Well, you would think since this is part two that, uh, you know, maybe it would be a little shorter, but I still have a lot. So let's, uh, let's pray and just dive right into it. All right. Amen. Father, I submit to you, Lord, we, uh, we are here to be led by you, God, that your word can uh, speak into our lives right where we're at, God. So I ask that you would use your word in power, God, for everything that it was designed for in this day. Thank you that there's no expiration date on your word, God, but that it applies to our lives even today. Have your way in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, for those of you that either weren't here last week or... Um, maybe already forgot what happened last week. Uh, the title of my message was, It's No Coincidence. Um, so if you're taking notes, this is technically, It's No Coincidence, Part 2. And uh, last week, we looked at Exodus chapters 4 through 6. And in that portion of Scripture, it includes uh, Moses and Aaron's first meeting with Pharaoh, the aftermath of that meeting, where the Hebrews were forced to find their own straw, but make the same number of bricks. You guys remember, anybody remember? And we talked about how Pharaoh's strategy in that was to keep the Israelites focused on their work and on their hardships and the challenges in order to make them see God's promise like it's a curse. So, and they even verbalized that to Moses and Aaron. Do you guys remember that? They went in, the Hebrew foreman go in and meet with Pharaoh, right? And plead with him, like, don't do this. Like, it's, it's ridiculous. And they come out and essentially curse Moses and Aaron for bringing this upon them. They're seeing God's promise as a curse. We also talked about how complaints can make those called and sent by God question themselves and their calling. Uh, we saw that with Moses. And we talked about how God is well aware of your situation in the natural, and he's well aware of his covenant with you in the spiritual. And so, as I meditated on the word from last week, and um, I make a practice of watching my, <laughs> my sermons back, not, not because I'm that proud that I'm like, yeah, you know, but to learn, right? To learn and grow, because this is still new to me. Um, and so I wanna, I wanna be real with myself. So as I meditated on that, um, I really felt, like Joe said, like we needed to take more time to focus on that last point. That last point, that God is well aware of what's going on in the natural, and he's well aware of his covenant with you. Amen? So, again, as I look back on it, I, I realized that I had focused too much on emphasizing what the enemy does or what the enemy did in the, you know, in the story or, or whatever. Um, and, I mean, it's important that we recognize that, you know. <laughs> uh, our enemy is real. Satan is real. And he works to... Um, he works against the plans of God in our lives. And we have, to, we have to know that. We have to recognize that. But I don't want that to be the focus of, of our lives. Um, we have to be aware of it so that we can be prepared to defend ourselves. <laughs> right? That's why the Bible talks about put on the full armor of God. Um, and not just defend ourselves, but to take ground. Right? Right? We don't stand back and wait for the devil to hit us. We go out and meet him, right? Because we know that we win. Amen. So our enemy can't stop the plans and promises of God in your life. 
but he can come against you and try to discourage you from pursuing what God has for you. Just like the Israelites were discouraged from pursuing what God had called them to, which was to leave Egypt. So, he wants to make life difficult for us. He wants to stop us. He wants us to give up, right? And he'll do anything and everything in his power to do that. But today, I want to focus more, like I said, on what God is doing, right? He's well aware of what he's doing, just like he was well aware with the Israelites. And it's even part of our, our tagline there, be a part of what God is doing, right? The tagline isn't like, come hear about what the devil is doing. So I apologize <laughs> for overemphasizing the, the uh, enemy's part in our lives last week. But let's stay focused on what God is doing. So I want to stay positive because God is at work among us. I don't know if you guys see it or not, but he is at work among us. I hope you, I hope you see it. We're learning, we're growing together, and he's leading us out of slavery and bondage into his freedom, into his promised land. Can you say amen to that? <laughs> amen. So, uh, grab your Bible or pop your Bible up on your phone and let's go to Exodus chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. And guys, <clears throat> I can't overemphasize the importance of being in the Word on your own. If you're doing that, praise God. If not, bear with me as I read through this. Are you with me? Exodus chapter 7? Yeah. Then the Lord said to Moses, pay, pay close attention to this. I will make you seem like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. Tell Aaron everything I command you, and Aaron must command Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave his country. But I will make Pharaoh's heart stubborn, so I can multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in the land. Make note of that. We're going to come back to that. Even then, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you. So I will bring down my fist on Egypt. Then I will rescue my forces, my people, the Israelites, from the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. When I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. It's another place to make a note. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 when they made their demands to Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Pharaoh will demand, show me a miracle. When he does this, say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh and it will become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did what the Lord had commanded them. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh called in his own wise men and sorcerers and these Egyptian magicians threw down their staffs, which also became serpents. But then Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard he still refused to listen, just as the Lord had predicted. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn, and he still refuses to let the people go. So go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes down to the river. Stand on the bank of the Nile and meet him there. Be sure to take along the staff that turned into a snake. Then announce to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to tell you, Let my people go so they can worship me in the wilderness. Until now you have refused to listen to him. So this is what the Lord says. I will show you that I am the Lord. Look, I will strike the water of the Nile with this staff in my hand and the river will turn to blood. The fish in it will die and the river will stink. The Egyptians will not be able to drink any water from the Nile. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, take your staff and raise your hand over the waters of Egypt, all its rivers, canals, ponds, and all the reservoirs. Turn all the water to blood. Everywhere in Egypt the water will turn to blood, even the water stored in wooden bowls and stone pots. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. As Pharaoh and all of his officials watched, Aaron raised his staff and struck the water of the Nile. 
Suddenly, the whole river turned to blood. The fish in the river died, and the water became so foul that the Egyptians couldn't drink it. There was blood everywhere throughout the land of Egypt. But again, the magicians of Egypt used their magic, and they too turned water into blood. So Pharaoh's heart remained hard. He refused to listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord had predicted. Pharaoh returned to his palace and put the whole thing out of his mind. Then all the Egyptians dug along the river bank to find drinking water, for they couldn't drink the water from the Nile. Seven days passed from the time the Lord struck the Nile. I want to continue reading this, guys, but it is going to get kind of long, and I don't want to lose you. <laughs> uh, I want to treat you like children, but I know it gets kind of long listening to somebody uh, just read. So we're going to stop there for right now, and I want you to take note of kind of this progression, right? So Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh. They tell him what the Lord says. And God's very clear that he's going to use miraculous signs and wonders, right, in the land of Egypt. And he's going to do it so that the Egyptians can know that he is Lord. And as you continue to read, you can do this on your own time, maybe later today. As you go through, we've got, okay, we started, we read the plague of blood. Then it goes to a plague of frogs, plague of gnats, plague of flies, plague of livestock dying, festering boils, hail, the worst storm that Egypt had ever seen, a plague of locusts, darkness. They said the darkness was so thick that they couldn't even see each other, uh, the Egyptians, and then ultimately death to all the firstborn males in the land. But what you'll see as you read through that is that that same pattern continues Moses and Aaron go. They proclaim to Pharaoh. They do the miraculous sign. It's awful. Pharaoh says, you know, pray for me, I'm sorry, or whatever. And, and then uh, the Lord relents, and then the next plague comes. But it's over and over again. And what I want you guys to see in that is, number one, it was, it was the Lord who hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, I know that that's difficult to, to kind of like come to terms with because, you know, God is love and like, well, how would God ever, why would God ever do something like that? Well, why would God have Joseph's brothers throw him into a well and then sell him to Ishmaelite traders into the slave trade? You know, it's like God, this is just an extension of God setting up his plan and his purpose for these people. So, my challenge for you guys is as you, as you read through this, have, in your life, has, has there been, have there been any difficult circumstances or difficult people in your life? Anybody? Yeah? <laughs> So the challenge is, are those difficult times, difficult people, potentially part of God's plan to get you where he wants you to go? Do you see, what, you see where I'm going with that? Okay. It's an extension. That's why I'm, this is an extension of last week. It's no coincidence, right? It's no coincidence that when God's trying to push you somewhere, take you somewhere, that you very well could hit difficult situations, difficult people, right? But it is to help you, not to discourage you. You see? The enemy uses difficulty to discourage you and to make you quit. God uses it to teach you something about yourself and make you stronger so that when you come into the land that he's taking you to, you're prepared. Amen? If Moses and Aaron would have gone straight to Pharaoh and he would have been like, you know what, you're right. That sounds like a great idea. Why don't you guys just all leave and good, you know, have a great day. I don't know that 
that process would have prepared Moses and Aaron. I don't know that it would have prepared the Israelites for where God was taking them. So it's just a shift in, in perception of how do we view difficult situations? How do we view difficult people? Are they just something to like get away from us? Do we like run away from that? Or can we start to see it as, okay, Lord, what are you, what are you doing here? You know, why is this happening? What can I learn? What's, what's the plan? Amen? The other thing I want you to take note of as you read through is just like it was God's plan from the beginning for these things to happen, it was also God's plan to show off through signs and wonders, right? He was going to use these awful things to show off and to um, bring glory to himself. He, he says in uh, chapter 7, verse 5, where we read, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord, right? It wasn't even just for the Israelites. He wasn't just like putting his fist on Egypt to punish them so that they would let the Israelites go. He, was, he also wanted them to know that he was the Lord. It was all part of God's plan to make sure that everyone would know, everyone Amen? Does that sound familiar? That's the plan. That's God's plan for us, that everyone would know. And so I want to encourage you today with that as you read through it. God wants to use miraculous things, signs and wonders, even today, to prove to you and to prove to everyone else that He alone is God. Amen? And you'll see as you read through, it's very interesting. Um, there are some of the plagues, like the plague of blood, um, frogs, and gnats, I believe. Yeah, the first three. Where it doesn't say specifically that the Hebrews or the Israelites were affected. But then as you go down, plague of flies, it says specifically that the Israelites were spared. There were no flies in the land of Goshen. So it's entirely possible, if you read this literally, it's entirely possible that the Israelites themselves suffered through some of the plagues. You know, it says specifically the ones that they did not. Um, flies, livestock dying, plague of hail, and um, darkness, and death. So I believe whether they, here's the thing, it doesn't really matter, right? <laughs> it doesn't really matter if they suffered through those with the Egyptians or they watched. God was also using those signs and wonders to bring them back to the place where they believed him, where they trusted him, where they obeyed him. Do you remember last week, uh, for those of you that were here or that checked it out online, um, the first time Moses and Aaron come to the elders of Israel and tell them what the Lord has said, they accept it, they receive it, right? And they bow down and worship. But then as soon as it gets hard, they're like, no, we don't want anything to do with this. Like, you know, God's curse be on you <laughs> for bringing this on us. So God's also taking them through a process, right? He wants the Egyptians to know that he's Lord, but he also is like gaining their trust back. Like, look and see and know that I'm God. And there's no other God. So God not only wants to show off through signs and wonders for the benefit of others, in your lives, but also for your benefit to bring you back to that place uh, where you trust and obey. So I encourage you to ask yourselves, what signs and wonders have you seen and experienced in your life or in the lives of others? You know, maybe, maybe you didn't get healed, but maybe 
you've seen other healings take place. Um, you know, maybe the person that you've been praying for hasn't accepted Christ yet, but you've seen others. That's a, that's a miracle for real. So it's just a reminder for you guys um, that God wants to show off through signs and wonders and that we should be aware of what we've already seen and experienced. Amen. As you read through the rest of this text. So the third thing, sorry, that was one was uh, it was God who hardened Pharaoh's heart, right? Because he had a plan all along. Number two, it was God's plan to show off through the signs and wonders. Number three, it was God's plan to lead the Israelites back to the start, back to the beginning, which is what we were talking about. Um, God wanted the people's hearts, right? Like I said, he, he could have set it all up where Pharaoh just agreed right away and said, sure, go for it. But I don't know that he would have had their hearts entirely to be able to lead them out into the wilderness. And he wants our hearts today. Amen. He doesn't want us to just be. He wants our hearts, all of us, completely surrendered to him. So where is your heart in relationship to God today? We got to be able to ask ourselves these questions. Where's my heart in relationship to God today? Not yesterday, not when I was a kid, today. God wants our hearts today. Amen. So, the, the whole story, right, and it, it, goes, it goes all the way through chapter 12, until finally Pharaoh relents, and not just relents, but <laughs> says, get out. He says, get out. But through the whole story, it really comes down to this. That God has a plan. Right? God has a plan, and it's not always going to be happy-go-lucky Everything goes smooth just the way you would like it to. And especially for you kids, kids, quick, hey. <laughs> Listen, your parents might already be telling you this stuff, but I want you to be able to read, read your Bible, read this story, of the Israelites coming out of Egypt and I want it to stay with you as you grow up and as you go out into the world because I don't want you to think that if I'm a Christian everything's going to go well for me and, it, and life is never going to be hard. Unfortunately that's not true but what I can tell you is that even in the hard things God has a plan, right? Your job, our job, is even in the hard times, even when you just want to run away and give up, we have to remember that God has a plan. That'll keep us from falling away. And then when our focus is on what God is doing, not on the, the difficulties or the trials or our complaints. That's when we can move forward. That's when we can be free. Amen? That's when we can go to the promised land. Because at that point, it doesn't matter what happens in, our natural, in the natural. All that we care about at that point is what's happening in the spiritual, what God is doing. Amen. Are you with me on that, kids? Amen. Yeah? Cool. All right. Life is hard, but God is good. Amen? Amen. <laughs> you can write that one down in your notes. So, like we said, 
Our enemy is real. Satan is real. He works hard <laughs> to fight against us, to fight against the plans of God. But our job is not to forget that he is defeated. Right? He is defeated. And he can try and try all he wants, but he won't succeed because the battle has already been won. Jesus already won the battle. He already won the war. His blood covered our sins. Amen? It's our job not to forget. We have to remember that no weapon formed against us will succeed. Right? No, no health issue. No uh, challenging person. No difficult situation can succeed against us as long as we keep our eyes on what God is doing through it. Like I said, it doesn't mean that we won't face challenges. It just means that in the end we win <laughs> because Jesus already won through his death and his resurrection. Amen? That's the hope that we carry, that no matter what, we win. Amen. We win in Jesus. And the last thing I want us to keep in mind as we read over this story is to invite God to show off in your life. Right? So when those challenges are coming, when those issues are popping up, when difficult things are happening in the natural, in your life, it's an opportunity for you to invite God in to show up and show off through signs and wonders, the miraculous. Amen? Don't allow discouragement to make you put your head down and feel like there's nothing that can be done and that you just have to suffer through and try to get to the other side. God wants to show off. He can do it. He can do all things. But will we step out in, in faith and believe? He doesn't want to show off in our lives by allowing us to live the American dream. He doesn't want to show off in our lives by giving us everything that we want. That's not how God necessarily shows off all the time. He gives you the desires of your heart, and He's a good God. And if you ask for bread, He won't give you a stone. But ultimately, He wants to show off through your lives by you becoming a conduit of His love, His glory into the world around you. So the challenge is allow God to use the good, the bad, everything. Allow His plan to work out in your life. If you're frustrated by it, that's okay. <laughs> you can see throughout the Scripture, it's okay to be frustrated with God. He's big enough. He can handle your frustrations. But don't let it turn you away from where He's leading you. Amen? Don't let anything turn you away from the plan and the purpose that He has for your lives. So, is that encouraging for you guys today? Anybody else going through anything hard right now? Anybody? You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. It's no coincidence. It's no coincidence. I was telling a couple of these guys so that they could pray. But, uh, Yesterday, 
I'm upstairs trying to get ready. Jody allowed me to have some time to myself to prepare. Um, ended up being like the whole morning, but <laughs> she's a trooper. Um, but yeah, she did something normal, just normal, regular thing and tweaked her back. So she spent the rest of the day yesterday in pain. And uh, then last night, I woke up at like 1.30, 1.40, had to like jump out of bed and my stomach was in knots and and I just, I'm just like, okay, okay. It's no coincidence, right? Like, if I'm going to preach it, I might as well live it, right? It's no coincidence. But I'm not going to allow those things to turn me aside from the assignment that I have today. I'm not going to allow it to turn me aside from the assignment that I have tomorrow, this week. You see what I'm saying? That's what I want to encourage you guys with today. We're not going to focus on what the enemy's doing because God has a plan and the enemy can't stop it. So don't see difficulties and issues as always attacks. It's entirely possible and biblical that God could be leading you through something. God could be orchestrating these things in your life. Do you see that? I know it's hard. <laughs> but He's good, right? Just like the song that we sang. He's good. He's good. And that's what we have to stand on. That no matter what, He's good so that we can trust Him, so that we can follow Him, so that He can lead us out. Amen. Flip real quick to chapter 12. Like I said, I spared you guys from reading the, the entire thing. That was actually my plan, but I got up here and was like, no, I, that's, that's not right. <laughs> chapter 12, the end of... Verse 27. Just give me something when you're there. Amen or something. Okay. When Moses had finished speaking, right? This is after, this is after everything. Everything that they've been through. Everything that they've witnessed. When Moses had finished speaking, all the people bowed down to the ground and worshipped. And verse 28 says, So the people of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded through Moses and Aaron. That's where God wanted to take them. It didn't have anything to do with them necessarily obeying Moses and Aaron. Moses and Aaron were just sent to present what God was doing and to keep pointing the people back to what God was doing. But the whole point, God goes through all of this, all of the plagues and the signs and the wonders. Why? So that the people of Israel would come back to that place where they were at the very beginning when Moses and Aaron came to them, where they bowed down and worshiped and did just as the Lord commanded. Does that make sense, guys? I pray that God doesn't have to take us through <laughs> all, of those, all of those things to get to that place where we will do what He commands. But I want us to be prepared for it. I want us to be prepared for it. So that when it comes, when the difficulties come, there's no turning aside. There's no shrinking back. There's no going into defense. Right? We're going to keep pushing forward. And we're going to go where God has called us to go. Amen? You guys with me on that? Let's walk forward together in that. Amen. I just want to pray over you guys real quick.
And if you could, guys, remember, remember to pray for us as well, um, especially for, for me and Joe. We need your prayers. Um, I know you guys deal with um, the schemes of the enemy. I, I know that God's taking you somewhere. He's doing the same thing with us. Um, and we need your prayers as well. So, thank you. So let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for your word, Lord, that teaches us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you open our hearts and minds to receive the word of God. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would move among us now. That you would highlight for each of us where the difficulties lie that are part of the plan, part of the process. Lord, so that we can learn and grow so that we can not get stuck in the midst. Lord, give us strength. Clothe, clothe us with your armor so we can advance forcefully, Lord, like you've called us to, like your word says. And that we would not be afraid of any attack from the enemy. That we would stand on your promises, God, and move forward together as a family. Lord, that we would cover each other, that we would watch each other's backs, Lord, in prayer. God, that we would lift one another up and not tear each other down. God, that there would be unity in this place, unity in this house, Lord, unity in your body. And God, that that spirit of unity would extend from us into the churches in this region. Lord, that you would begin to uh, link arms, the arms of your body, that we could be your hands and your feet that we could love one another the way you've called us to. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm prepared to let you guys go.